pleasure to welcome you uh, to this very first uh, data science conference here at Rice University. My name is Jan Odegaard. I'm the executive director of the Ken Kennedy Institute for Information Technology at Rice and associate vice president for research computing. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few little things, you know, have a little bit of a safety moment um, and just get the, the road on the show here. Um, so what, what is the Data Science Conference? It's really about bringing people in Houston together and beyond Houston, although I've been looking at the demographic initially today, uh, it's very Houston-centric this year, and that is to be expected, and that's what we hope to have. Uh, it's about creating a community of networking around data science as sort of a topical area. Um, it is a private-public partnership. This is not a meetup. It's not a conference, an academic conference. It's not a trade show, but it has flavors of all of these components, and it really depends on each of you to engage in those opportunities to participate. What you take away from here is a function of how much you engage, visit with people, talk to people, engage with people about their problems. I would also challenge you uh, to maybe go to talks that's not in your own domain, there's really a lot of learning going on at, uh, if you attend talks that are not in your comfort zone because that's where you can discover some things like, oh my goodness, that problem looks like mine. But it's just a different set of data, different set of problems uh, you know, and, and algorithms and you can take that back home and you can then start applying it in your own domain. Um, it's, a, it's about fostering engagement across disciplines, across industry verticals, across communities. So use the opportunity that we create to, to, uh, to leverage that and find those uh, connections. Um, so this is really the pie chart, it's very simple. Industry meeting, data science, uh, IT industry meeting, academic, you know, and then it's the interface of that, that's us. So what does that look like specifically this year? Uh, as of an hour ago, there was 445 people having signed up for the conference. I still think there's several people in the elevator, several people coming later, planning to attend. <laughs> Uh, because I saw a fair number of name badges over there. Um, also, I know that some of our students, they did sign up intending to be there for the poster session. Uh, you know, of, so there's a fairly large, about 25% or so of rice academics, non-rice academics, you see the oil and gas industry, sort of divided into sort of two segments. So I'm working on that yellow slice to the people that are not in the oil and gas. However, we welcome all of them. Um, the healthcare industry, uh, the two IT, uh, the two, three segments I really want to work on over the next year in preparation for next year is really to, to engage with those smaller slices up there because I think there's some unique opportunities for all of us to engage with sort of finance, space, transportation, government, and sort of the non-traditional Houston verticals in industry. And so I would challenge all of you to make sure that you take the message back, whatever you thought about the conference. Uh, introduce people, uh, them to me or my colleagues uh, here, and we will engage and follow up and, and you know, maybe we'll grow this community in sort of its diversity in industry verticals, uh, etc. Uh, uh, I couldn't do this on my own. There's always a huge team behind this. Uh, the program committee is certainly critical. I mean, if I can take a second, can ask whoever is here from the program committee to stand up and so we can recognize them. If you're on the program committee, please stand up. Uh, if you so, there's several people here. Let's give them a round of applause because we have them. This, this wouldn't happen, and it is sort of always an interesting uh, sort of uh, puzzle to put together sort of a good program committee. And I try to recruit them for the long haul and have them engage because we we all learn something along in the process of that. But also logistically, it wouldn't happen without the staff I have. Um, you know, Victoria Langley, which many of you may have met, and, and Debbie Heath, they're both invaluable in putting this on. Many of you have communicated with them on email already. And, and as I said, you know, I'm doing uh, some stuff, but this would absolutely not happen without Victoria and Debbie. So when you see them, thank them, and, and all their, their helpers and staff out there, Rice staff and students. Um, so let me move on here. Um, I also couldn't do this without our sponsors. So our gold sponsors, AMD, Cray, and HP Enterprise, uh, Euler Packard Enterprise. Our silver sponsors, I'm not gonna read them. You see them on the side of, my, of the podium here. Um, and the bronze sponsors. Um, and then the venue, uh, you may have one. A couple of uh, save the dates. Um, we are also organizing a conference every year in the spring on high performance computing uh, with the oil and gas industry. So that's a big conference that's coming up in March. We've done that uh, for 10 years. This will be our 11th. 
Um, next fall, we're going to have our data science conference. This is going to reappear here on October 8th and 9th. You will get more about it. Subscribe to our mailing list, follow us on Facebook, and so on and so forth. And uh, with that, I, it's my pleasure to invite our, uh, uh, by the way, I have one more note. Turn off your cell phones. This is your opportunity. So, uh, you know, because, you know, you, you don't want to be the speaker when somebody's phone goes off. And Red, Red probably reminds me I need to find my phone when I get over to my desk here. So, and if you tweet during the event, if you tag it with RDSC, Rice Data Science Conference 17, then you can follow that and, and people can, uh, can see your tweets and whatnot. So I encourage you to tweet uh, and, and create an online activity also. So with that, it's a great pleasure to uh, invite the, the, the provost, uh, Marilyn Miranda, up. I'm not big on introduction. I'm, she wanted to say a few welcomes. She's a data scientist. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> and uh, and it, uh, she wants to say a few words. Okay. Since I'm wearing heels, I can actually stand behind this podium and be seen by you. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here to welcome all of you to the Data Sciences Conference. Uh, as you may or may not know, Rice is making a major investment in data sciences. Uh, that includes faculty recruitment um, in traditional data science uh, departments like electrical and computer engineering, computer science, applied math, statistics, but also across the entire university. So we have brought in the past year more than <clears throat> either through the data sciences initiative or through other hiring that we have going on. We have uh, brought more than a dozen people who are uh, real card-carrying data scientists to campus and we're anticipating doing more of that. Our partnerships with industry are incredibly important for us um, as we push our data sciences initiative forward and we're so grateful for the support of this conference from our industry friends. Um, you know, when I first came to Rice two years ago, um, so as Jan mentioned, I'm in the Department of Statistics. I'm a data scientist. So for me, you are my people. It's very exciting to be here. Um, but when I first arrived here, there was the, there's always a narrative when you arrive at a place. And the narrative about me was that I was a data-driven decision maker. And um, which, when I first arrived here on occasion, meant that I was a soulless, godless, person who uh, didn't understand that values should play into decision making. So we are increasingly in a world where there is so much data that's relevant to the kinds of questions that uh, we have to answer, to the kinds of decisions we have to make. Um, <clears throat> but we also at the same time need to remember what our core values are driving us, especially in a mission driven institution like Rice. And I think that one of the, a great example of how really good data collection and data-driven decision-making can allow an institution to live its values occurred for us here at Rice uh, during Hurricane Harvey. So as the extent of the impact of the hurricane, um, the likely impact became clear, it was very clear to us that we needed to get information as quickly as possible on everybody in our community. And uh, we had a group of students who responded to a Facebook post. One of them, uh, one of our postdocs, Max Grossman, is here. Uh, so we had these five uh, young people who came in and you know served as great research assistants on this whole project. So it all got started having that personnel power got started off of a Facebook post. And then we, we uh, developed a needs assessment that just had seven questions and we made the deliberate decision that we wanted to get the answers to seven questions on as many people as possible as opposed to the answers to many more questions on a smaller number of people because of course there's that trade-off. So the questions were, you know, what's your name and, and attached to that is their unique identifier which we just use their email addresses, right? Um, what's your address? Do you have children? Do you have power? Do you have internet connection? Has your house been damaged by the hurricane? Has your car been damaged by the hurricane? So seven pieces of information. Took about 90 seconds to fill out the survey. It was mounted on both, it, it mount, was mounted in such a way that it was easy to do on both the PC or a handheld device. We have about 12,000 members of the Rice community and within Within about 72 hours or so, a little bit more than that for some areas of the university, of those 12,000 members of the community, we could account for about 11,200 of them. 
And that information allowed us to develop the plans that we had in place for uh, creating a housing matching program to make sure that none of our community members ended up in a shelter. They were all uh, sheltering with other members of the Rice community who were unharmed during the hurricane. That allowed us to develop a carpooling service for people who had trouble with their vehicles due to hurricane damage. It allowed us to develop the um, plans for what kind of temporary child care did we need to make available on campus because we knew which schools were closed and where people lived. It allowed us to develop the financial assistance programs that we offer to students, as well as the financial assistance programs that we offer, that we are, we are offering to students and to faculty and staff. So it's a funny thing that you can collect seven small pieces of information on most of the community and it can shape a whole series of different um, programs and policies, all of which were designed <clears throat> to deliver what we call at Rice our culture of care. Uh, to indicate to people, we're concerned about you, we're worried about you, we want to know what's going on, we want to be helpful to you. So for me, when I think about data science, I think about the power of data science to transform our society in all kinds of ways technically, but I also believe uh, that data science has the power to transform our, our society into a more connected and a more caring environment as well. It's not simply about just generating masses of data. I'm absolutely delighted that all of you are here. I'm looking forward to participating in the conference itself, and I'm very grateful to the Ken Kennedy Institute for all the hard work that they've done getting this organized. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Miranda. My name is Keith Cooper. I'm the co-director of the Ken Kennedy Institute. And be, on behalf of the Institute, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Um, the provost mentioned that we have a data science initiative underway. As one part of that, the, we are looking for ways to interact with the <coughs> Houston community, with the community beyond Rice's Hedges. So if you have ideas on that, I'd urge you to pigeonhole either Jan or me during the breaks or during the networking sessions. We're interested in having those conversations. Now to the main event. It's my pleasure to introduce Eric Berger. You know, an academic gives an introduction that's, that's an academic in introduction. So let me say that Eric has an <coughs> astronomy degree from the University of Texas. He has a master's degree in journalism from the University of Missouri. And he's a certified meteorologist. For 17 years, he was a fixture at the Houston Chronicle. Today, uh, at the Houston Chronicle, he was, he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2009 for his coverage of Hurricane Ike. Today, he writes for Ars Technica, and of course, he is one of the moving forces behind space city weather. Weather prediction is one of those places where the combination of more data and more computation have radically changed our ability to understand the world around us. Kelvin Drogemeyer from the Center of Analysis and Prediction of Storms in Oklahoma gave a great talk here about 10 years ago where he showed, among other things, he showed a beautiful uh, chart on the accuracy of weather prediction. The simple question, will it rain tomorrow, plotting the accuracy of that forecast across all jurisdictions that the, that the US Weather Service made the prediction. And in 1956, the accuracy of that prediction was less than 50%. You were literally better <laughs> off believing the opposite of the forecast than believing the forecast. By 1987, it was up to about 70%. And by the mid-90s, it was up over 70% on the five-day forecast. Better data, better computation. In 1991, I was at Supercomputing, the, the large international conference, and I remember having a great conversation with a, a journalist from the New York Times who was astonished. He had just come over from the Cray Research booth, and they had told him that within a year or two, they would be able to predict the path of a hurricane computationally. I felt a little I felt a little bad pessimistically pointing out to him that it would take the computation longer to make that determination than it would take the hurricane. 
But if you look at, if you look at the world today, we live in a world where meteorologists run multiple hurricane models. They run ensemble models where they try 30 sets of initial conditions to understand the sensitivity of the prediction to the starting conditions. And oh yeah, we should believe the five-day weather forecast. So weather's of, of concern to all of us, and it's in particular one of the places where the combination of data and computation have changed the game. What does it have to do with us today? Well, during the lead up to Harvey, the endless days of rain, and the aftermath, I discovered something about my community. It became absolutely clear that Rice faculty and staff rely much more heavily on Space City weather than on any other source of meteorological data. It wasn't just one person or two persons. Every Rice person I know on social media either reposted from Space City weather, liked it, or messaged me to tell me I needed to be following these guys. It's, it's amazing, because in academia, you never get unanimous opinion. Yet, the one I have found this year is behind Eric Berger. With that, it's yours, Eric. Thank <clears throat> you.